look on behalf of Australian Mineral Fertilisers and Grow Safe, but also as a farmer in the area, um, it, it would like to welcome you all here. And we're really proud to sponsor this event. Um, just to get such a great range of speakers, some having to come from New Zealand, but we know that they know what they're doing. <laughs> um, and yeah, and just have you all here. So we're really proud to be able to do that. We've, we've he held many events over the past uh, 17 years. And for me personally, this is probably the most exciting one that I've been involved with. Even though I have to say it was a lot of people in Australian Mineral Fertilisers actually organised the event and I had very little to do with it. Um, just quickly, I want to go through basically um, and talk a little bit about the company. It's not really about the company today, it's about just information, but Australian Mineral Fertilisers um, um, started manufacturing a, a, a alkaline mineral compound fertiliser 16 years ago, so we've been around. And it was a, a biological based fertilisers and it was mainly looking at the commercial broadacre agriculture. Primarily we wanted to offer a serious alternative, and meaning serious alternative means something that we could research and show that had efficacy in, in production and, and was in performance, and a bit of an alternative to the high chemical, high soluble fertiliser inputs that pretty much dominates agriculture now. Looking at soil health was number one, so looking at soil health through remineralisation and soil biological micro, soil microbes was the focus of what we did. So in the development of these fertilisers, which took quite some time, and it also took a long time actually to, to produce a fertiliser of good quality. And I'm not talking about quality in the field, I'm talking about handling quality. Um, and that took a number of years and a very expensive process to be able to produce a fertiliser that is comparative in handling and as good as what can be imported. And we are manufacturers in Australia too, and of course that has its own, its own issues. We produce an alkaline fertiliser with 60 minerals in it. They include soluble and slow-release NPKs, so we're not you know, anti-soluble fertilisers, not anti-use of chemicals, but we understand the influence of these fertilisers on soil biology or have a, a basic understanding because there's so much to learn. And so we use both the slow-release phosphates, the guanos, and the soluble phosphates, but a lot less. Look, we, we need a great diverse range of minerals in agriculture, and it's not just for the plants, it's also for the animals, our stock and ourselves, but also for the actual soil microbes themselves. So this is why you know, we have 60, 65 different minerals in the product. And some of them, we only need a teaspoon in agronomical terms on a farm. You know, the difference between probably good legume inoculations, uh, nodulations might be you know, um, a teaspoon of molly per hectare. And we're not talking, so really, we, in our fertiliser, with the cobalt and the selenium and everything else that put in it, that is in it, has a role somewhere and it might not be particularly in the plant growth, it could be to do with the biology and it certainly could be to do, definitely to do with our health. Um, Grow Safe evolved as a farming program out of all this work we did. Um, and it's a really basic, I can't read it from there, but basically the productivity of our plants, the quality of our food, we eat relies on the vitality of the soil in which it's grown. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the soil, soil microbes, mineral complexes and the plants that realise this production. What we've found in all these years and, and, and with many clients, that we had overall improvement of soil health. And we're talking about organic carbon, better res plant resilience to handle moisture stress, better root development. And this year, which was really interesting, we had a number of clients contact us in the wheat belt that had a lot better outcome with the frost damage. And that was to do with plant health and plant resilience. There's also a lot of positive environmental outcomes. You know, we, we use a lot less phosphorus and a lot less leaching than phosphorus. And so as part of um, my involvement with NRM, you know, a big issue is like the Wilson Inlet, um, and all the inlets in our waterways is the use of high levels of phosphorus and, and nitrogen and what it does to that. So there's an environmental outcome which is really good. And the remineralising of the soil, for me personally, was about stock productivity 
And how I ended up being involved with this company and founding this company, or being a co-founder of this company, was what I saw on the farm, and which started about 20 years ago. We're finding that when you look after soil and you have remineralisation, not only do you get better stock productivity, there's a lot less supplements to use, you know, lick blocks and additives. And a really interesting thing is a lot longer shelf life on fruit and vegetables, which is a really critical issue in that industry. Look, research and development was a foundation of how GrowSafe uh, programs, uh, how we developed our GrowSafe programs. The company um, won an innovative um, industry award from Aust Industries some years ago for our, for our research. We knew that if you, we had to understand through proper R&D how to improve our programs, but also to get an understanding. But also, we're in an industry which does do a lot of R&D, and we had to match that to prove, our, to prove how successful or how we could develop the soil biology. What's really interesting, I found in all the research, and up there is just a list of research that I won't read through, you can read yourself, that we have carried over since uh, 2004. And we still got many we're conducting as we talk now. But what we found really interesting was the side effects of chemicals. Now, in the medical industry, if you go to a doctor, they should say to you that if you're going to take this drug, here are the side effects and you can make an informed decision. Well, in the farming industry, the chemicals we use have side effects. Exactly the same, but we just don't know them. Um, or we're not informed of them. And so what we did is we looked and at a lot of our R&D, looking at what effects herbicides and fungicides, pesticides have on the soil biology and how that affect the productivity of what we were doing. We weren't looking at perhaps the effect on health, we were specifically looking at biology. So that was our benchmark to say, well, we think that chemical is good or that chemical might not be good. So we're not anti-chemical. It's just that we wanted to see what the effects are on our program and what we did. And a lot of it was really interesting. And so there were some really interesting effects. We had certain herbicides actually totally took out protozoa. And protozoa, which I'm sure will be talked about later, was a critical bug for our soil. But when we did the trials, investigated the biological activity there, we couldn't find them. Um, we know mycorrhizal fungi, which is the king of probably the biology that a lot of people have heard about or understand about. And we understand that the fungicides, it's a fungus, so of course fungicides are going to affect it. But we also found that some fungicides didn't affect it so much. So yes, fungicides could be used and still manage a, a good biological system, but it's the type and how, how they're applied. The other thing we found is on particularly mycorrhizal fungi is that too much soluble phosphorus stops mycorrhizal fungi fixation to a plant. Now, that's a freebie. Mycorrhizal on the plant is a freebie for minerals, but it's not just phosphorus. It's about organic matter, glomalin, and everything else mycorrhizal done, does, and it might not be specifically just about um, phosphorus. You know, what, we, what this research did show is you can have highly productive farming in yield and return and be biological and use a care, careful, managed use of chemicals. So it's not left or right is we're trying to get a, a middle-of-the-road approach here and try to get the best out of everything. I, I've been in agriculture since the 70s. Um, and if I look back in the 70s and, and we talk about what was being said there in ag um, by our peers, and it was the soil is just a medium to hold up our plants. And probably a lot of you might remember this. And all the agronomical requirements will be supplied. All the nutrients, this sounds a bit like hydroponics, all the nutrients, if you've got a, fun, a fungi issue, fungicide, if you've got an insect, whatever. So subsequently, we have all the chemicals you need. It's beautiful. How easy. Dial up, you know, go out there and I want a chemical, I want a herbicide as a pre-emergence or a knockdown or a selective or a pasture manipulation or I've got a fungus. But what it's done is it ta it's taken us away from actually looking at a problem. You know, we're not, what's our problem? You know, why we have these issues? Anyway, what is really interesting is, is oh, sorry, 
if you look at a snap, that, that's, that's what we were told, and that's what we do right now. Now let's have a, a snapshot of what the average farmer is doing now. And, and, and in cropping, in broad island cropping, you would have two to four applications of herbicide to grow a crop. One to two applications of fungicide, one on the seed, one as a post, and maybe even more. One to two applications of insecticide, sometimes none, but sometimes more. One to three applications of soluble nitrogen and starter fertilisers. There's our cropping program. In pasture, for it is a bit less, but we're still dealing with one to two insecticides because if you buy seed for seeding, it's generally coated with insecticides. Red leg, aphids, whatever. Fungicide, definitely on the seed if you're planting or renovating pasture. Scorch, powdery mildew, etc. And of course, there'll be one to two herbicides, whether it's fodder production or pasture manipulation. And one thing about pasture ma manipulation, which really scared me, and we went off that on our farm some years ago using the hormone sprays, is I watched Four Corners last year or the year before, and, and they just informed us that these type of sprays have got dioxins in them, some of them as high as Agent Orange. So that scared us a lot because I was concerned about my family and everything else and the food we produced to think that, okay, I'm not sure about the actual chemical itself, but there's a fairly big history of dioxin and how deadly it is. Now that, was, that came on four corners, so that makes me very disappointed in our chemical regulators because I thought the chemical regulators are people who actually help. Okay, so here we are. That's, that's where we are, the situation right now. But the hard thing to deal with is we have huge root disease issues, particularly in the wheat belt, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Phytophthora. We have herb herbicide resistance. We have non-wetting, which is the elephant in the room. You know, non-wetting, claying is a very successful method of dealing with non-wetting. And in, in horticulture and, in, you know, backyards, claying is a really good option. But to clay in broad acre, and I know it's very successful, I'm not knocking it as claying, but it could cost as much as your farm itself. Um, soil acidity. Once again, there's a debate between you know, our organisation and many others of, about lime, but putting that aside, in the south coast alone, in the next 10 years, we're looking at between 10 and 20 million tonnes of lime. 20 million tonnes if we use our local lime, which apparently is not very good, and 10 million tonnes if we pull it at about $80 freight or $60 freight from near Perth. So, so claying, I'm waiting. And, and where, what do we ended up with? We've got, you know, problems with our soil. So we've got a lot of problems, and I think it's really important these issues are a result of how we farm. Look, in, in, in summary, I, as I say, chemicals they've got to use. There's no doubt. Claying's got to use. Lime's got to use. But as a farmer, there's no way that I would be as profitable as I am as a farmer if I was looking down the barrel to do all that, because this is massively in, 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 uh, expensive. For our own farm, which I just, um, I've been given the tick to move on, um, my own farm, you know, there is a, a saying that, um, uh, I suppose, a um, a statement, and it was Albert Einstein, he said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so I moved away, or Kerry and I moved away from using high soluble fertilisers, um, and not all chemicals, because we still drench our sheep, but we, we are really working very hard to deal with that, um, 20, over 20 years ago. And the productivity of, of our farm, and many people have been to our farm, we've probably had 500 visitors over the last six or seven years, and it is highly productive in return, in stocking rates. And when it comes to mineralisation and getting minerals in our stock, which is what I was, my key picture, or my, my key message was, is it's the best way to get minerals in an animal or a human is through the feed not through supplements. And so that's why remineralisation is such a thing. Look, pretty much that's it for me, but um, we have an age-old saying, and I know I'm pitching a bit of um, Carol's, uh, is we are what we eat, and that is really critical. So if you know, we can grow a great lettuce or a great bit of wheat or whatever, a bit of pasture that looks fine, but nutritionally is really poor, 
So, and I think that's something that we really have to think about. And once again, look, thank you for coming, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of this, and I, I know I will. Cheers, thanks. Thank you.